God's word for our meditation this morning is the epistle lesson appointed for this, this sixth Sunday of Easter from 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter writes, Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. And after being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. This is the word of the Lord. There are some Christian churches that have done away with the creeds. Those Christian creeds that, that we hold so near and dear, those Christian creeds that we confess nearly every single Sunday, the three ecumenical creeds as we call them, the Apostles, the Nicene, and the Athanasian, that have done away with them. Not, not that they don't believe in them, but they find no value in using them, in, in speaking them, in teaching them. In fact, there are some churches that will say, give us deeds, not creeds. Trying to say by that, that, you know, those are just words, and they don't mean anything if you don't live them, and so why speak them? Now, I would agree, if you don't live them, what do they really mean? But creeds are important. The word creed comes from Latin. It comes from the word credo, which means I believe. A creed is a statement of faith. It's a confession of what we know to believe, be, what we believe to be true from the word of God. A creed helps us explain what is in the Bible and what we believe from the Bible. Creeds are very important. And there's no command in the Bible that thou shalt recite one of the creeds every single Sunday. We have Christian freedom to do that or not to do that, but it is a good thing. It is a beneficial thing because it focuses us back on what we believe and why we believe it, and what it means for our life and for our eternity. Because our creeds determine our deeds. What we believe will be reflected in what we do, how we live, how we talk. And so our creeds, what we believe, our statement of faith, our, faith, our profession of faith is, is very important. What's your creed? What statement of faith, what profession of what you believe is, is, is your life making? Has your creed been money is where I'll find my happiness? Is your creed, your statement of faith, what you profess? Is it, I'm trying to find my value 
and my fulfillment in earthly relationships? Is your creed, your, your statement of faith, what you believe to be true about your life and who you are? Is it living for me? Not really caring about the needs of others? What's your creed? What is it that is your, your statement of faith? What you believe, what you profess, and what you're showing to the world? Is it sin's really not a big deal? It really doesn't matter that much. You just kind of do what you want to do and with no real regrets or guilt or seemingly bothered conscience? Because, friends, you know that your creeds determine your deeds, right? And you might not say those things out loud. You might not confess them for the world to hear with your mouth, but... But the world can see by how you live what's really important to you, what it is you really believe, what your creed is. And if it's money can buy me happiness, or I'm trying to find my fulfillment and value in earthly relationships, or sin's not really a big deal, or I'm just living for myself, I really don't care about the needs of others, Kind of an empty way to live, isn't it? And I'm guessing you haven't found real true satisfaction, and contentment, and happiness, and value, or fulfillment in any of those things. Your creeds have been determining your deeds, haven't they? How you live, what you say, how you spend your time, how you spend your money. Your creeds have been determining your deeds. And if that's just been resulting in emptiness for you, if that's just been resulting in just all these things that are temporary and momentary and fleeting and things that are letting you down and, and things that you just keep chasing after but never being able to quite grasp, maybe it's time to consider a different creed. And there's one before us here in our lesson from 1 Peter. You kind of wonder if some of the writers of the early creeds, those, those three ecumenical creeds, had this section of scripture there as reference. Because you see here in this lesson a statement of faith of something that we can put our trust in, of something that is lasting, of something that is of great value and worth, where we can find fulfillment and peace and contentment and joy. And it's not anything to do with your life at all. It's nothing to do with about how you feel or about how people make you feel. It's really not about you at all. It's about Christ and what he has done for you. We have here before us this beautiful creed, this statement of faith, this I believe that if this is how you live, knowing that this is true, if this is what you profess and this is what you believe, life is completely different. It is. The reason you live, how you talk, how you act, how you spend your time, how you spend your money, how you parent, how you act as an employee at your job, everything is different if this is true, if this is what you believe, if this is your creed. Peter writes by inspiration of the Spirit. Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Think about what that means. 
Christ suffered for you, for your sins. You, unrighteous, with no righteousness of your own, that righteous one, that holy one, suffered in your place so that he could bring you to God. So that you could know peace with God. So that you could have the promise that God loves you and holds nothing against you and is expecting nothing of you. It's Christ who did it for you and has brought you to God. You had nothing to do with that. The righteous for the unrighteous. The sinless for the sinner. The obedient for the disobedient. The holy one for the sinful one. For you. That is our creed. That is our belief. And that changes everything. Because God is not someone you have to earn favor from. God is not something, someone you have to please. Through Jesus Christ, he is already pleased with you. Through his death for your sin, and him giving you his righteousness, and bringing you into his presence, you have life. You've got eternal life, yes, but you've got new life right now, lived in that peace and in that joy. And friends, that changes everything for you in this life. Peter writes, he says, Christ was put to death in the body, but he was made alive in the spirit. You see, he died, but then he rose. He was made alive again on that Easter Sunday morning. Very early that morning, his eyes opened up again. He rose from the dead to prove to us that death has been defeated, that our sins have been removed from us, that the gates of heaven are open to all who believe, as Jesus said in our gospel lesson, because I live, you also will live forever. And think about what that means for your life. That is our creed. That is what we believe. That is our statement of faith. That we have the promise of life forever. Because that tomb is empty. Jesus lives and so do we. And that changes everything. There's no need to fear death. The grave has no power over you. Where, oh, death is your victory. Where, oh, grave is your sting. It's gone. It's taken away because Jesus lives. After being made alive, Peter writes, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. Our statement of faith, our creed, what we build our hope and our joy and our peace on, Four little words right in the middle of the Apostles' Creed that we confessed just a few minutes ago. He descended into hell. That's what this passage is about here. One of only two passages in all of the Bible about Jesus' descent into hell. We sang about it in our hymn of the day right before our sermon. Did you catch it? About Jesus descending into hell. And what did it say that he did there? He bound up the strong man. You see, Jesus' descent into hell. Jesus going in his body into that prison to make that proclamation to those imprisoned spirits there in hell was one of victory. That he won. That he had defeated death and he had defeated Satan himself. That strong man Satan has been bound up. And think about what that means for you, dear Christian. Think about what that means for your life. That this is your creed. That this is your statement of faith. That Jesus descended into hell after he had rose from the dead. It means that the devil has no power over you. Satan, that seeming strong man, has been bound up. That lion's teeth have been removed. That ancient serpent's head has been crushed. He has no power over you. Jesus proclaimed victory over him in hell itself, and that is your victory over him too. The devil can come with all of his lies and all of his temptations, and you can say, no, 
You have been defeated. You are dead to me. Those lies mean nothing to me because I know the truth. My creed, my confession, my truth is Jesus has defeated you. He crushed your head. He descended into hell to proclaim his victory over you. It's done. Away from me, Satan. Peter goes on. He says about that flood uh, in that ark, in that ark, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Friends, our creed, our statement of faith is that our baptism has saved us. It's so amazing. It's just mind-blowing how, how the Holy Spirit had led the Apostle Peter to, to get this connection. Right? When, when, when that Holy Spirit first gave this to Peter to write down, he must have been like, what? what? The flood and baptism? This is amazing! That flood in the Old Testament that washed away all the wickedness and evil from this world was a foreshadowing of what baptism would do for us. It washes away from us all that is wicked and evil. And as it saved Noah and his family, as they floated on those waters in that ark, now it says it saves you also. It's not the removal of dirt from the body. This is not some sort of physical washing. This is a spiritual washing away of all of your sins, of all of the wickedness, of all of the evil, so that you can have a clear conscience before God. Your baptism assures you that your Heavenly Father is well pleased with you because of Jesus Christ. That there's no guilt, there's no fear, there's no condemnation. All is gone. You can stand before the holy God clothed in the righteousness of Christ that you received in the waters of your baptism where you were united with him. You were put to death to those sins and then it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You were raised with him to new life. That is what your baptism means for you. You have new life in Christ. You are not guilty of your sins. And your assurance every day of your life is you are baptized. If you ever doubt it, if you ever wonder, does God love me? Am I forgiven? Is God really pleased with me? Yes, I'm baptized. Those waters assure me. That is our creed. That is our confession of faith. That is what these scriptures declare. God for us. God coming to us in those waters with that word to assure us that we belong to him. He has placed his name on us. We are his children. We belong to him now and forever. Think about what that means for your life, dear Christian, that you are baptized. You are a son or a daughter of the Heavenly Father right now and forever. That's who you are. Because you are baptized. Peter goes on. He says, This Jesus Christ has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Next Sunday, we're going to celebrate the festival of the ascension of our Lord, and so I'm not going to steal my thunder for next Sunday. But this is our creed. This is our confession of faith. This is what the scriptures declare and what we believe and what we build our life on is that Jesus died and Jesus rose and Jesus descended, but then he ascended. And he sits at the right hand of the Father with all power and all authority, with all angels at his bidding over everything for the good of his church, for you and for me. Think about what that means for your life right now. That there is nothing, nothing in this world that Jesus is not in control over. There is no evil 
There is no earthly authority. There is no spiritual forces that Jesus does not have in control for you, for your good, for your eternal good. This is our creed. This is our statement of faith, and so there's no fear. What can man do to me? There's no fear. What can any spiritual force do against me? Jesus reigns, and Jesus rules, and Jesus is my king. King of the universe, king of my life, king of my heart, king for me. Dear Christians, this is our creed. This is what we believe. This is what the scriptures have revealed to us. And by faith, we know and trust in. And this creed determines our deeds, doesn't it? When we know this is true, we're gonna, and we live like this is true, the world's going to see. Where we find our hope and our peace and our confidence not in the things of this world, not in money, not even in people, not even in myself, but in Christ, who died and rose and descended and ascended and has clothed me with himself in my baptism. This is what empowers me to go and to live, to live my life in this world for him. And that's going to show. Your creeds will determine your deeds. And Peter here in this section shows us what that looks like in our life. He says, who's going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Peter says that your life takes on a greater meaning and purpose. Your life is, is going to be different when you believe that these things are true. If you really believe it, you're going to be willing to do what is good even if you have to suffer for it. He says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. This creed will determine how we live, but also what we say. That we are willing to speak about it. That we are willing to proclaim Jesus Christ crucified and risen and descended and ascended to make him known. Now, Peter's original audience was undergoing persecution and suffering for their faith. They were outright losing home, property, maybe even life for their creed for their statement of faith about Jesus Christ. And by God's grace, and thank him for that, right now that is not the case for many of us or all of us in this room. It's not the same for all people in this world and all Christians throughout this world. But right now, we're not suffering outright persecution for our creeds. So how might this look for you right now? What this might look like is saying no to anything or anyone that would lead you away from this creed. Even if it might mean ending a friendship. What might this look like in your life? Being willing in love to point out someone's sin because you love them. And as Paul sa or Peter says, we do this with gentleness and respect. But my creed is going to determine that I have to speak the truth. And I have to speak it in love. So that I can share the message of a wonderful Savior with them too. 
And you know that's not always going to go well, is it? What might this look like for you? It might mean forgiving. Forgiving when someone has hurt you. And they've hurt you really bad. And maybe that pain of what they've done will, will never go away in this life, but, but still to forgive. As you've been so forgiven. And that's hard. What might this look like for you? It might look like doing the right thing and the godly thing, even when no one else is around. When no one else is there to hear or to see what you're doing. Our creeds determine our deeds, what we do and what we say. What might this look like for you? I'm willing to take a pay cut if it means that, that I can be in church on Sunday morning and I can be with my church family and I can worship and I can hear the word of God and receive the sacrament because that means more than any amount of money. <laughs> How might this look for you? It might be, in spite of what others around you say, unashamedly going to church and reading your Bible and praying You see, our creeds are going to determine our deeds. And if this is what we believe, that Christ has died, and that Christ has risen, and Christ descended, and then Christ ascended, and that I'm clothed with Christ and his righteousness in my baptism right now, your life is going to be different. What you say is going to be different than the world around you. How you live is going to be different than the world around you. Your confession is going to determine how you live. And the comfort, dear Christians, is that when you fail, and you will, this Jesus Christ died for you, and he rose for you, and he descended for you, and he ascended for you, and he takes you back to the waters of your baptism and says, look what I did for you. Look who you are. And there again, he empowers us to see what that resurrection life looks like. Life lived in the shadow of Easter. Life lived in the reflection of that empty tomb and all that Christ has accomplished for us. That the creed that we want our life to be driven by is Jesus and his work for me and his love for me that my creed determines my deeds and the life that I get to live for him and for his glory in this life. I know that some churches have gone away with the creeds reciting them in church because, I don't know, maybe it's, it's old-fashioned or it's, you know, that's from so long ago or you know, all of these different reasons that they might have, but we're not going to stop. <laughs> we're not going to stop using them. And not just because it's tradition, not just because it, it makes us feel good. But they're not just words. When we recite those words together, they're not just words. They're what we believe. They're what our faith are built upon. They are a clear representation of the scriptures and the truths that we find here. They are our life. Without them and the truths that are in them, we have no life. But with the truths that those creeds reveal to us and that we get to profess with our mouths, we get to go and live that truth then and speak about that truth. May God help us to speak those words in faith, to go and live them in faith, all to the glory of God. Amen. Please stand.